Hey everybody out there on Facebook, this is Chris Bedford here with the Daily Caller News Foundation. We're here with Katie Freitas and Christian Daytalk, and we're joined by a special guest, Dr. Lonnie Johnson. Now, if you haven't heard the name yet, you've absolutely played with the toys, or at least bought them for your children to do untold amounts of damage to your property. <laughs> <laughs> the inventor of the Super Soaker, one of, which has, I think, been in the top 20 best-selling toys since... It was released the on the market. Forever. You know? Yeah. yeah. It's getting, Longer getting, than I've been a lot. Action, I'll tell yeah, you. yeah. <laughs> and also a serious developer of the Nerf gun. And when he's not spending time on his full-time job, he has time for his hobbies, which include, included working on the Stealth Bomber, the Galileo <laughs> Project, the Cassius Probe? Cassini. Cassini Probe. See, I'm obviously a reporter, not, of not NASA. a scientist. Yeah. Not a scientist. <laughs> and so he still keeps time, you know, for space exploration and some of the stuff you know, for the children. But generally, <laughs> he, I think, most famous for this. So thank you for joining us. Well, my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. So what, what brings down to Washington, D.C., up to Washington, D.C., from Atlanta? Well, I was invited to receive an award. <laughs> well deserved. Well, uh, an, an inventor award. I guess this is in celebration of Black History Month. That's fantastic. And so, uh, so yeah. Doctor, I want to know, tell me about um, that time that you almost burned down your house when you were a kid. Because that <laughs> cracks me up. She's been up. talking about this for two days. It's, it's hysterical. I really yeah. want to know like the story behind that, and I believe it might have involved trying to make some Causing jet fuel. Causing trouble for parents <laughs> since you were a child. Yes. So, <laughs> not to mention the Barbie dolls, those poor dolls. <laughs> Tell us what happened with that. Okay. Well, when I was younger, um, I got interested in the space program at a very young age. In fact, it was around '62, I think it was, that President Kennedy said we would put a man on the moon uh, before the decade was out a very challenging um, proposition because we didn't have the technology to do it at the time. And in fact, he acknowledged that we don't have the materials, we don't have the know-how, it's never been done before, but we're going to do it before the decade's out. So it was a challenge for the entire nation. So you got right. Immediately. <laughs> skip school and work on the There project. were some times when I skipped school to work on some projects, I will admit that. We've all been there. <laughs> <laughs> to work on projects, right, yeah. Um, that was a robot. But anyway, so I was interested in rockets and um, was interested in how they worked. Um, I wanted to build my own. I first started out by buying these little model rockets from a company called Estes. They still, they're still in business, in fact. They make model rockets and you can actually buy them. But then I wanted to go to the next level. I wanted to be able to mix my own rocket fuel, build my own rocket. And the whole now, as rocks. one does as a yeah. child. <laughs> To so, attack the neighbor's kids, so, right? <laughs> the neighbor's cat, I bet. <laughs> so I went to the um, library to look up rockets and rocket fuels and try to figure out how to do it. And so I found this one book that really explained how to design the rocket and even gave a formulation for the fuel. Uh, so, so dangerous that they have that in a children's library. <laughs> but I'm so happy. If we were smarter, we would have figured that out growing up. Well, they did eventually, I think. <laughs> yeah. So... But the ingredients, I, as you know, as a kid, grade school kid, I didn't recognize a lot of the ingredients. And so I built the rocket and everything, but I didn't have fuel for it. So it sat in, the, in my mother's kitchen for a long time. It looked great. Was she really thrilled to have this rocket in well, the kitchen? Well, I mean, she was, she was okay with it. It was just sitting there. It was a, basically a metal tube with a nose cone and pins and so forth. It looked kind of cute. It, wasn't, it at least wasn't causing trouble. Right. It was just, it, <laughs> and it was unfueled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... Actually, one day my mother sent me to the pharmacist to pick up a prescription. And so while I was there and waiting on the pharmacist to fill the prescription, I was just walking down the, the aisles and reading the various labels on the, on the items on the shelf just out of curiosity, not expecting to see this one ingredient that I didn't know about. And it was there. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and a lifetime of crime. Yeah, again. bottles of this. And so, yeah, I, I purchased them. And um, took it home and finished the composition of the, of the fuel. And uh, the first time it was just mixing the powders together and it burned. It was really exciting and nice. And then, okay, I'm ready to put it in the rocket engine now, but the, the instructions called for heating it, turn it, and it would melt uh, one of the ingredients down. It would form a, um, a serpent like structure, a composite. And you pour this into the body of the rocket, and then as it cools, it would solidify. solidify it, so it would become a solid propellant inside the rocket. And so I was stirring this 
fuel in the kitchen on the stove because I had oh, to no. ha have a heat source to melt it. And everything was going great. It was melting down very nicely. And then it was just one little corner on the edge of the pan. I saw this little small spark. Uh oh. And I knew that there was no way for me to stop it. Just continued to spread. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, no. And the flames started shooting up out of the pot, you know, and the smoke was so thick you couldn't see your hands in front of your face. It was just that close. It was really, really bad. Sparks were flying all over the place. And of course it was very scary. I backed away. The only thing I could do was just back away from it. And then when the smoke finally cleared, um, there were a few uh, small holes in the kitchen chairs, but the kitchen didn't catch fire. That's, That's good. good. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> that is good. And when my dad came home, he looked at me and said, you're going to have to mix that outside from now on. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a fair rule. Yeah, he bought me a hot plate. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's <laughs> so perfect. I could continue my habits. That must be a, a, a good dad to be in between, like, I want to I wanna give you a weapon, but you seem smart, and I don't want to discover. Let's foster you. this. <laughs> how do I do this without turning you into a supervillain? <laughs> <laughs> now, how, how old were you when that experiment took place? Oh, I would say... Say about 14. Okay. 13 or 14, somewhere in there. That makes me feel better about what I was doing at 13 or 14. <laughs> I thought this might have been like seven or eight years old, you know, no, prodigy. I was, I was a little bit older than that. Kicking over anthills and just digging. I was, at that I, age. somebody told us if you mix gasoline Sometimes. with styrofoam, you can make napalm. I don't know if that was Allegedly. really napalm. I, I got my first hand do. scars. <laughs> Because it goes, it gets on you, and like, doesn't well. stop burning. But you guys are dangerous. <laughs> oh, that was so really, we did it in the woods, so we wouldn't start a fire. We're high rows at heart yeah. when we're well, children. And That's we did it in the woods, so it's not to start a fire, yeah. which is extra stupid. Yeah. <laughs> because the woods is where the fire really hurts. <laughs> mm. The last so, place you want to be in a fire is in the middle of a wooded area. Mm. <laughs> so, and your second project was, was, and one you won in the award of the science fair, was creating a robot based kind of, at least I read, kind of based on the lost in space robot um, and one of your later projects then is this robot probe that you've sent to Saturn to take well, a look at the rings well I can't say that I sent it um, but you helped. So, so I helped I was on, <laughs> I was on the team that um, on the design team on the systems engineering team that great and, and that was a core team that pulled all of the various systems on the spacecraft together and made sure that well, let me back up a second. The way this, those large systems are developed, literally, these are one-of-a-kind spacecraft. So, you know, you have a mission, you have certain science that you want to accomplish, and so you identify scientists from some of the top research institutions around the country, and they, def you know, make a case for their instrument being on the spacecraft. So their instrument, they get someone to help them work with them to design the instrument. And then you have the spacecraft itself, which includes the attitude control system, the, the propulsion system, combustors, and all the rocket engines. <laughs> <laughs> the rocket the, the, fuel. The for, for the less <laughs> smart people the, in the, the room. The central computer, uh, the uh, attitude control, the radio, the communication systems, the power distribution and control. You have all of these things that make the spacecraft the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. Of course, the structure there and the power source. And my, my job on the Galileo project in particular was the uh, power source, so I was responsible for integrating the power system onto the spacecraft. And this was a nuclear power source. Our, it's called radioisotopic thermoelectric generators. That's and, what, uh, that's, yeah, that's <laughs> of course. <laughs> and it used plutonium-238 as a heat source. Oh. Wow. Bricks. Wow. <laughs> Bricks. You're nervous. In 2017, yeah. I was off my game. Yeah. I know. I don't think I missed a single one in 2016. I don't think you've recovered since that dark day. I, I was listening. Like, keep <laughs> I was listening. You okay. were listening. Everyone ignore Christian. Okay. Like always. So yeah. what happens? I'm just getting ignored. Where was I? <laughs> the, on the nuclear so, propulsion system. So, Naturally. so my job on, this on that spacecraft was to um, make sure that for the various phases of the mission, I'd run uh, analysis to make sure that we could power all the systems that needed to be on. For example, uh, when, the, when the upper stage was released from the shuttle, then there was this upper stage burn that uh, took the spacecraft out of Earth's orbit. That's and a long trip, so. And it's a long trip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I recall it was several years. Um, but in any case, um, various maneuvers on the way, but then when you get start getting close to uh, Jupiter, there was a maneuver where the spacecraft would release the probe, and then it would change its trajectory. So the probe would actually go into the, the, the um, 
planet and go into the atmosphere, the spacecraft would go into orbit around so that it could relay data from the probe back to Earth. And we had a problem on the spacecraft where um, because we used memory that had to have power all the time, the computer memories, if we ever lost power to the computer memories, they would come up empty and uh, there would be no programming. Give that sounds like a problem when you're yeah. flying through space. Yeah, you got to remember not having any information. You know, <laughs> that, that, that's a good point because when I went to JPL with the idea, I wanted to know how they did that because mm -hmm. it seemed like magic. You design a spacecraft and it literally is in, in transit for years going to an outer planet and you hear about these failures and things going wrong and then the scientists on the ground, the engineers recover the spacecraft, solve the problem and the mission goes forward. So I did learn how to do it. It was a lot of hard work. I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> thought no process and what if. And so we had this one problem with there was a short circuit of some failure or instrument or something like that had an internal short and caused a, the power to go down, for example, like in your house if you trip a circuit breaker or something. Mm -hmm. Power goes off. The spacecraft would automatically start sh sh shedding all of those loads. Everything, would, any, anything non-critical would be turned off. And then it would start switching things back on to bring the, bring the spacecraft back up. If the load does not, or the short circuit or problem did not clear itself, it would be down long enough that the backup power source would, would drain the backup um, mm -hmm. capacity. Is actually what is what was used. And then you the so, government money. And we didn't have we didn't have a solution to this because the concern was that well, if you have a circuit, a figure that lasts longer than a certain period of time, then this, you could get the power back, but then there would be no program, and ET. ET could not call home. <laughs> yeah. and, it's, and you had a long startup. Oh, it was frustrating. There was no yeah. just restart. You could slide. Right. Uh, well, so um, I came up with this uh, circuit that we call the memory keep lap power supply. So it would actually connect to the RTGs, radioisotopic thermoelectric generators. So when you circuit break and start opening up, the relays isolate each, there were two RTGs that would be isolated from each other with these diodes, and so the current could only go one way, so if, even if the short circuit was in the power source, they would be isolated from each other. One couldn't pull the other one down. So I said, well, those diodes, we could take a little power off of that, boost it up, and supply it directly to the memories. And there were people saying, oh, that voltage is too low, it won't work, you can't do it. And you we won't know until you try, right? Right. Well, that was my point. I told the chief systems engineer, Ron Draper, I said, Ron, when, when I put this idea forward, uh, these guys are going to say it won't work. And when they say that to you, let me know, then I'll go home and build one in my garage and I'll bring it in. <laughs> So I'm assuming that probably happened at some point. <laughs> no, it actually, it didn't happen, fortunately, <laughs> because you know I would have to deliver on that threat. <laughs> True. So we, uh, working with the the engineers there at at JPL, when the, when the idea was presented, that was enough to really um, push the issue. We made it work. We got it on the spacecraft, and, and people me, stopped doubting you. Yeah, it was a major moral victory for that reason. In fact, I had one guy who actually came up to me after afterwards and said, "Lonnie, I wanted to I want to apologize to you for the things that I've been saying about your idea." Behind your back. Yeah, yeah like, wait, what were all the things you were all saying? The mean things yeah, I'm, I'm like, which, by the way, now you know. I'm saying like, well, what did you say? He wouldn't tell me. <laughs> like, don't worry about it. Oh, man. I'm sorry, though. It's water under the bridge. I just apologize. Yeah. I didn't say anything a lot of other people were saying, though. I'm just so you, so you well, know. You've had a couple fights. So when you, you just won a fight and a, and a pretty big payout a few years ago from the guys, the Nerf guys, because they were not quite giving you enough of your royalties. At any point after you won, did you lean over to these toy executives and be like, you just tried to outsmart a rocket scientist? <laughs> right? What were you thinking? Hmm. By like fudging a decibel, it's like, I, oh, math and numbers is actually my thing. My kind of my forte. Right. <laughs> Seeing as I travel through space. Actually, yeah. no, I didn't. In uh, fact, I was feeling bad about um, the relationship having gone sour. So it was, I, I felt the whole thing was a lot. I, I one time so got all that money you had, you had the patents for both Super Soakers and Nerf guns because they're your invention. And what was it called? The Power Drencher? The power super drencher? Or the was power, drencher, power was, drencher was what super, when super soakers first came out, it was called a drencher. Mm -hmm. That's a very and 80s name, and I love <laughs> everything about it, to be honest. <laughs> and um, someone claimed that they owned that name and they had mm. a copyright on it because they put drencher Can't on imagine what the heck that was. A, 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 some other water gun. And so the second year, we changed the name to super soaker. 
And it sucked. Oh, yes. Yeah, I mean, it was part of my childhood. My it's dad bought them for the kids, but well, yeah. 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 they could chase now. the dog. I mean, yeah, it was for him to chase the kids and dog. Yeah. And obviously, the Daily Caller buys a healthy supply of them for the office. Oh. Oh, oh. oh hell of shit. Oh. I don't want to say we're single-handedly keeping, you know, so, no, superstar no, business because no. you help. They reached so, close to a billion dollars in sales. Our space reporter told me this beforehand, so if he's wrong, Andrew Fault, I'm coming for you. That the Cassini probe is going to commit suicide in one of the rings around September. I had. In September. I believe that is the case. I had not been following the spacecraft. So, that was, that was my not. next question. I was wondering if you were going to feel sad. Like, what if you were to, like, sit there and look at the stars and have a scotch knowing your robot just killed itself? <laughs> and it's, like, you your know, creation. Is it, it like the robot? What's the robot in that movie that saves the little but, kid but, and flies you, up into the sky yeah. and blows up? But, yeah, I, I do. Yeah, I had not thought about that for a while. In fact, when I did hear about that, the idea is to gather data that you otherwise would not get because you don't actually go into the rings. And um, so it's science. I mean, the yeah. whole, whole You tell the robot science. that, like... <laughs> This is going to be rough, <laughs> but you know, this is an it's important It's going to be harder for me than for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm a human. Be gone. Well, do you, what, do you, what do you think is the future for space exploration? Do you think uh, it's, oh, it's wow. machines or humans? Private or public Like, like Mars. Or private there's public. a big wow. push That's with Mars right now as well. Like well, there's a lot of interest in going to Mars. You hear all of the things that NASA's doing. Well, a lot of people I know. do crazy so. People. You can't come back. I don't know if you call them crazy. I mean, <laughs> do you want to go? Adventurous. You know, adventurous. That's the word. They're adventurous, <laughs> and they're willing to take the risk and you know, and, and go for it, which is which is cool. I'm, I'm glad we have people I'm so like that. <laughs> yeah, so we don't have to go. Exactly. <laughs> right? I was just flying over. I'll help design it, but I don't know if I want to get you there. I'm like going, though. I was flying over back from California a few weeks ago, looking out the window at all the desert for, like, hours and thinking, who the hell kept going? There's yeah. no shot. I'd be like, I'm going back to Boston. Well, you know, <laughs> this is insane. You know, what's interesting to me, I was, now that you mentioned that, I was, um, Bill Gates came out with this statement saying that we need a, a miracle, an energy miracle to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. We need to do within a, uh, a few years what normally would take 100 years or more. And I thought about that and I came up with this vision and so I put this chart together that showed the um, Columbus's flagship, the Santa Maria. Mm -hmm. And I put the uh, Saturn V rocket on the same, and it was a scale drawing. So the Santa Maria was this small ship, it was about 300 feet long. I wouldn't take that across the Atlantic. No, it wasn't 300, That's it was 35 feet, it was about 30 something small. feet long. And the um, uh, Saturn V rocket was about 300 something feet tall. But anyway, the, the ship, wood and sticks, traveling about two and a half miles an hour. The Saturn V rocket traveled about 3,000 miles an hour. It took a few hundred years to get from that technology. And the, think about it, the, 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 the ship was the best that mankind had to offer. This Queen mm -hmm. of Spain gave them the ship to come across the ocean. And, I, and it took about two and a half months, I think it was, to get across. And you could think, you know, this was a time when people were still wondering if the world or just coming to the conclusion that the world was round and exactly. not flat, right? I would have had to have such a gambling debt to get on that ship. I'm telling you, that's, that's the whole point. You know, you think, <laughs> I, I now know. Everybody, everybody on that ship, no doubt, was, I mean, there was a lot of faith, but yeah. I'm sure that everybody was not highly educated and enlightened. A couple desperate men. <laughs> definitely. Like, whatever was there is yeah. probably better than whatever's back there. So. Yeah. They owed no. some money. They had a bad girlfriend. Let's go. It happens. Some child support. I don't know. You wake up every morning and say, well, we didn't fall off today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 1400 was a crazy time. A lot of different people said they were monsters. Well, that's because yeah, that's I true. Believe, I there still are believe are it. <laughs> <laughs> when I go in the deep water, I'm like, I'm not going in that water. Yeah. <laughs> believe me. But yeah, it, um, it's interesting what technology does. And, you know, that's, that's what fascinates me. So when I was a kid growing up, we, it, was, it was not a... a, a very technical model, but one of my first models I built was a, a stealth bomber. And okay. you also built a stealth bomber, which makes us very similar. A little bit <laughs> larger than the model size, though. <laughs> well, I can't say I built the stealth bomber. <laughs> it was a team of engineers developing that, that, that aircraft. 
And that was an interesting experience as well. You know, there were people working on that airplane who had no idea what they were working on because the military has this way of, when you, you know, classify it or how it's classified projects, they'll compartmentalize it and give you a problem mm -hmm. to solve and you do this work, but you don't know what it goes. You don't know it's going to be the Until the end when they reveal it, you're like, oh, yeah, well, all right. Oh, yeah. Now I get it. Uh, <laughs> I did that. <laughs> or you may never know that what you did actually ended up there. And then you tell uh, your wife that you knew all along. Like, I, oh, I just had to keep a secret. Like, babe, look at what I did. I, yeah. I knew what I was doing. <laughs> yeah. Because I was, you know, in the military, so I was the first engineer assigned by the Strategic Air Command to that project from the user side. Now, the, in, so my job was to do the come up with the work on the flight test program where we would exercise the plane, make sure that it's going to meet SAC's mission requirements and so forth. And so I was in a situation where I could get, I got the second guess, the designers. <laughs> Probably a good <laughs> feeling. Kind of cool, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Were you at Hans but, was that at Hanscom Air Force Base, or where was that? That was at Edwards Air Force Edwards? Base. That's oh, okay. the flight test center, so the plane was going to be delivered there. But, you know, we'd go to uh, Northrop and on forklifts going down the hall and things like that. And in the hall, you see people, but you couldn't talk about what that was because there were a lot of people who didn't know what it was. It was interesting how that worked out. Um, it was a fascinating airplane, though. I, back back then, you know, it was you know cutting edge technology. So we would actually go into the cockpit or in flight simulators, and they actually had you know the screens. You could pull up the screen, and you could literally pull up all the systems on the airplane. So if there was an airplane, could land anywhere and refuel at your local gas station to take off. That's <laughs> <laughs> really? so when you found a road wide enough, right? <laughs> That's awesome. So, you know, I mean, there there are a lot of scenarios. I I don't know how much of that I can still. Talk about, but, yeah. but uh -oh. we probably that might heard it here first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You heard it here first. Yeah, yeah, not from us. That might that should be our next office purchase. I think it's just a flight simulator. I think. That would be awesome. No one's, not, no one's with me. I'm getting a flight simulator. No. You'll break it in a second. No, I'm an Follett expert. Would break it. Yes, yeah. He's a we space. He's a space it. reporter. In my mind, I'm an ace pilot. So <laughs> there's that. Yeah. that. That's what counts. It's all right. about visualization. It's right. Yeah? It's what's in your mind is what counts. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was, um, was it Einstein who said that imagination was far, far more important than knowledge? I honestly do not know, but that would not surprise I imagine that's I like that quote. And that's more important and than then, knowing. Than actually knowing. There you go. <laughs> well, and you know what? What is even more important than that is getting the doctor to his award on time. So oh, we, wait, first. Will you shoot a Nerf gun for us? Oh, sure. <laughs> Live Shoot demonstration Phil. from the theater. Oh, oh so we're funny! <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, that was, that was, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> fun <right? laughs> our, reporters, our reporters live in constant fear because of your technology. Yeah. I love Write that. a bad story, you're getting shot. Well, on that, we are out of beer and out of time, guys. Thank you so much for joining us again. That's Dr. Lonnie Johnson, the inventor of super soakers and Nerf guns. We will see you on Friday, so stay tuned.